TCP and IP. And they wrapped the IP a little bit, make a very simple transport layer that is called UDP. So the description here actually describes the TCP. UDP is not like registered mail. It cannot track delivers. And it cannot request new package if, the, uh, if one is lost. So um, right now, the transport layer protocol we are using almost just TCP and IP. If you remember this uh, uh, hourglass shape uh, TCP IP suite protocol, protocol suite. Sorry. Something pops up. So the transport layer um, is located between the network layer and the application layer. So obviously, it is uh, responsible for providing service to the upper layer, the application layer. And it receives uh, services from the lower layer, the network layer. And um, uh, it also pass the message some from the uh, lower layer. Lower layer, the uh, IP packets, the, the transport layer will pass that and uh, figure out it's a TCP segment or a UDP diagram. So if you remember last week, we showed that with the help of routers, all the hosts of internet, they get this illusion that they are directly talking with the other host without considering how data link layer works. So the IP protocol, they provide a service that delivers message from host to host. But however, we have many, many process running uh, host. If there is a, a web browser, a web server running, and there might be millions of uh, requests, and uh, they may all have different process. So we need a process to process delivery mechanism, and uh, that is what the transport is for. So if you took the computer op operating system class, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a 300 class here or 400 class? Oh, there are two? No, they changed it. I see. Okay. Oh, okay. So maybe some of you already know that there are some uh, inter process communication mechanisms within the same host. Uh, you can uh, share the memory, you can use the uh, signals to send a, a message to a lot of process. However, uh, we cannot do that over the network. Um, and uh, in order to communicate, communicate between process, uh, remote process, we need this uh, uh, messaging, message system. The transport layer uh, is to deliver that uh, message system. So if the process uh, initiate uh, this communication, we call this process uh, a client process. The web browser is a typical uh, client process. And uh, if the process uh, waits for the request, and we call it the server. And the, obviously, the web server uh, is a typical server process. And there are some applications, because browser and um, server, they all work at application level. They can, they can uh, construct, uh, they can have very complicated <coughs> structures to, to achieve their functionality. So applications like a, a P2P architecture, it has a client process and a server process at the same time. So the most important part to communicate uh, in a large network is uh, you need uh, an identifier. The identifier, uh, so people can use that to find it, to address it. And the data link layer we started, what is the identifier there? Anyone remember? What is the identifier as a data link layer? MAC address. The MAC address. And, uh, the MAC, and that is only for local network. So what is the uh, identifier at the IP level? The IP address, right? So at this transport layer, we also have this kind of uh, address or identifier. And that is called a port number. And that is just a logic number. It's a logical number. It's not really associated with any physical port on any network device. So here is uh, an example of the TCP header. So you can see that uh, it has a 16 bits source port number and a 16 bits of destination port number. And uh, you can see all other fields. Uh, but we're not going to uh, 
uh, discussed <coughs> today. So with this port number, uh, so first this port number is associated with one process. Sometimes it can be associated with several. And the operating system is helping the applications uh, to get a port number. So this uh, is another example of the UDP header. And you can see the UDP header is extremely simple. Besides the uh, IP header, which should be here, the UDP header only uh, and source port number and uh, destination port number and uh, lens and the checksum, minimum. It's a minimum wrap up of the IP protocol. So is port number enough to uh, address a process in the internet? Obviously it's not, because port number, there are only 16 bits. There are only more than uh, 64,000 port numbers available and they are local to your uh, host. So to address a lot of process in the internet, you need the IP address combined with the port number. So uh, there are some uh, uh, typical reserved uh, port numbers. So on the HTTP server, they usually use port number 80. It's not required, but if they use this, it's on the default. So if you visit ASU's website, you only need to put ASU's IP address in the browser address bar. You don't have to put the port number there because uh, it knows we are talking about port eight. And the DNS server they are use they are using uh, 53. And you can see that all those uh, HTTP servers or DNS servers they actually work at the application layer. So the application process they all get a port number. Does that apply to local networks as well? De depends on how you want to communicate. If you, the local network, you still want to go to um, the very high level, the application level, still they have an IP address and port number. But technically, because it's a local network, you, you don't have to use uh, the TCP protocol. You can build your own protocol on top of a data link layer protocol, right? So. TCP shorts for Transmission Control Protocol. And uh, it is a collection oriented, which means in order to send the data between two hosts using TCP, you need to establish some kind of a logical collection. This is not circuit collection, logical collection. And uh, uh, it is uh, reliable. The, 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 the concept of reliable here is uh, it's not uh, about security. It's more like uh, if one TCP segment is lost, uh, the server side or the client side does not get that TCP segment, the other side uh, will know that and they will retransmit that. So this is like the uh, register the mail. You can track. Uh, if lost, uh, they can help you to uh, reset. So there are some other uh, features offered by TCP, like uh, flow control, congestion control, uh, but um, you will learn more about that uh, in the computer network class. So um, in the security class, we just want to talk about the vulnerabilities in TCP and how to attack that. So one important feature uh, of TCP is uh, it provided this kind of a streaming service. So even though we have TCP segments, but when when that uh, operating system level offers the receive the data to the application, there is not, not really any uh, distinguishing indicator saying, oh, this is the segment one, this is segment two. For the application, they are just uh, streams. And the TCP does not really offer timing, minimum throughput or guarantees. And uh, the other protocol at uh, transport layer, uh, UDP. Compared to TCP, UDP is not reliable. It doesn't uh, guarantee uh, the transfer between sending and the receiving process. And you can say, so remember the uh, UDP header we showed just now? It's uh, very simple. It's just a very simple ramp 
wrap up of the IP protocol. But TCP protocol, they have all kinds of other fields to indicate the state of the uh, communication. And uh, they have a, a acknowledgement and sequence numbers to say if this package uh, has been really delivered. And the UDP does not offer those things. That's why you remember at the IP level, we call the uh, PDU um, diagram or packet. And uh, for UDP, we also call it diagram. We don't call it uh, segment. So since it's a diagram, uh, it's very clear where one diagram stops. And the uh, UDP does not offer collection setup, uh, flow control, all those features. All those features uh, that has to be indicated in the header. UDP uh, does not have that. So there is one advantage of UDP, which is it's really, really lightweight. Not only the header is much smaller, also the implementation on the network side, on the <coughs> server host, or on the client host will be much simplified. Because if one package is not delivered, you don't have to re-deliver that. You don't consider those things. So um, this is uh, all I have for the network overview part. So we are going to uh, dive into the security part. Uh, starting today with some uh, security concepts and the next way, uh, crypto foundations. Then we are going to review all the protocols uh, again. So the computer, the security concepts we are going to cover today uh, include, include the security uh, objectives, attack model, network attack types, and uh, security uh, mechanisms. So maybe some of you have uh, heard about this uh, CIA triad. Uh, there are three major security objectives we are trying to achieve. The first one is called uh, confidentiality, which means we should keep the information safe. It should not be disclosed to unauthorized entities. And the second one is uh, uh, integrity, which means the data or code or whatever information should not be modified, hampered, by any unauthorized uh, entities. And the last one is uh, availability, uh, which uh, is about how to prevent, detect, and deter improper denial of access to service provided by the system. So the, the CIA, they are the uh, basic security uh, objectives, <coughs> and they, it has a very convenient uh, name for you to uh, remember. So let's see some uh, examples. What do we mean by confidentiality, integrity, and uh, availability? Let's say in this class, we are using Blackboard. Uh, so in the Blackboard, we have the grid center. You can see your grid. But you are not supposed to view your classmates' grid. If you, if you somehow you are able to do that, uh, the confidentiality of the system is broken. And the integrity means you cannot change uh, your grade or everyone else's grade in this class. So sometimes this confidentiality and the integrity, they come together. But it's not necessary. For example, if we have a write-only system, so an attacker, they can write to the system, but they cannot, they cannot read. So technically, they can over write some information in the system which breaks the uh, integrity. However, since he cannot read, <coughs> he cannot uh, get the previous information, the previous data, it doesn't break confidentiality. And the uh, availability here means uh, your score should always be available on Blackboard. Whenever you want to access, midnight or anytime, it should be there. So obviously, this CIA they can mean uh, different things in different uh, scenarios. So in addition to this 
say I a triangle, there are some other objectives uh, we are trying to achieve. So today I'm only going to talk about uh, two very uh, interesting ones. The first one is uh, or synthesis which means uh, the insurance that a message, transaction, or any other kind of information is from the source it claims to be from, or synthesis. A second one is a long repudiation, which uh, is uh, a uh, assurance that someone cannot deny something, such as a receipt of a message, uh, or uh, send a message. So we, let's use a, a class example again. So let's say you are not supposed <coughs> to pretend as a TA to send an email to your cousins. If you do that, the authenticity of that email is broken because it seems like it's from TA but actually it's from a student. And the long repudiation means if the TA or any one of you, you did send a message, there is no way you can deny that. You cannot say, I didn't send that. There is a way to track you did send that. So let's talk about a little uh, about the threat models and uh, attack models. So basically, uh, threat models and uh, attack models they defines the ability of attackers and uh, how they launch attack. So they are just assumptions about the potential attackers and attacks. Why do we need this model, you may ask? So you can imagine any system, any computer system, will eventually be cracked. Eventually, someone will find, find a vulnerability there, and uh, eventually, um, the, the attacker's ability will get stronger and stronger then they find a new way to break the system that was not known before. So however, if we have a clear definition of an attack model, so we define this is the abilities of the attackers. <coughs> and we prove that as long as those attackers only have this kind of ability, they will never break our system. Our system is always uh, secure. So this is uh, the, the foundation to, to design, uh, develop, and deploy any security mechanism. If we don't have this, um, we, we, were, we will have no confidence in any security system, because we know that eventually all of them <coughs> will be broken. But with this, uh, we, can, we can at least say, as long as the, the attackers, their ability do not get stronger, our system will stay safe. So in all those uh, security uh, literature so papers, uh, the research projects, the very first thing that you do is define the attack model, the threat model. Then the design system prove that my system is secure under this model. And uh, if the, attack, the attacker's ability uh, gets stronger, that's beyond the, the question. My system is not going to work. I don't claim it. So there are many uh, attack types. And you may have learned a lot from your um, from operating system class, software security class. But uh, today, uh, I'm going to mainly cover network attack types. So there are um, eavesdropping, spoofing attack, man in the middle attack, delay of service, and uh, cache poisoning. So we are going to apply all the attack types uh, to the protocols we are going to review later. So we are going to try, can I eavesdrop this protocol? Can I do a spoofing attack in this protocol? Or man in the middle? So uh, if strong, very easy to understand. An attacker uh, just uh, have uh, gained access to the data paths in your network. So basically, uh, they can listen to the traffic. Uh, so if the attacker can 
uh, eavesdrop, which CIA property we as uh, defenders fail to provide. Confidentiality. So, what would be the approach to prevent this from happening? So encryption is a is a very basic method here. So if we encrypt that, even if the attackers can still uh, intercept our message, but they do not really understand the semantics of it. They don't know what it is. So this uh, if stroking attack uh, is also called uh, sleeping uh, in the network scenario. The second. Uh, attack type is a spoofing attack. So in spoofing attack, a malicious target will impersonate another on a network uh, in order to launch attacks against the other network hosts. They can. So uh, the purpose could be uh, a lot. They can steal data, they can spread malware, or uh, bypass some kind of uh, authentication or access control. Basically, a spoofing attack, you are uh, stealing some other host's identity. So, not really a host, it's any kind of identity. The identity uh, could be at la uh, any layer, could be data link layer, could be network layer, or uh, just port numbers. So, we are going to look at uh, some of the spoofing attacks later um, after, we, after we talk about crypto. So we are going to look at the ARP spoofing attack. Um, so I guess you can imagine uh, in the ARP protocol, uh, a machine wants to know uh, the MAC address of uh, one IP, one IP. So you will send out a message, who has this IP address? Please send me your MAC address. And if every host, every computer on the network, they are honest, the only the one who is that IP address where some will reply to <coughs> this message. However, um, there are many malicious nodes in the network. So a node that doesn't really have the IP address can also send out this up reply saying, I have this IP and this is my map, and please send the future packet to me, future free to me. Uh, fortunately, this attack cannot cause much damage in the internet. Anyone know why? Because this is limited to the local network? Exactly. Because that if you do a ARP spoofing, if you send a fake uh, ARP message, that message will never leave your router. It will be your local network. That's what we started um, early this week. And also there are uh, IP address spoofing attack uh, which will be more serious. So uh, we're going to cover that, I don't know, two weeks later maybe. And another type of uh, attack is called man in the middle attack. So in man in the middle attack, uh, an attacker will insert him or herself into a conversation between two parties. And uh, it will impersonate both of them. So let's say computer A or process A is talking with process process C, and there is a malicious process B in the middle. He's trying to pretend uh, it is process C to talk with process A. At the same time, it pretends to be process A to talk with process C. So the purpose of this is the, the man in the middle can hijack all the communications and uh, can gain access to all the data which is transferred. So in order to pull off this kind of uh, man <coughs> in the attack, uh, the malicious actor has to intercept uh, the message sent by both parties, uh, and they should be also be able to modify that, because for example, they have to modify the identifier field in those messages. And also, they should be able to send uh, and uh, receive to both parties. Um, not only this, sometimes 
they also need to block the original communication channel between those two original um, hosts. Sometimes it's not easy to do that. And the uh, uh, man in the middle attack, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, attack has been very success successful in the past several years. Uh, so um, there are some uh, abbreviations for it. MITM, MRM, they, they, all of them, they mean uh, man in the middle attack. So in this class, we are going to look at uh, at least uh, one uh, SSL uh, session hijacking. So in SSL, two parties, two processes, they are supposed to uh, establish a secure communication end to end. However, it's possible that uh, they have the illusion that they are establishing an end to end secure communication, but actually there were two encrypted secure sessions. One is between the first host to the attacker, the second one is from the second host to the attacker. So this is called the uh, man in the middle attack. And uh, another type of uh, attack which is really difficult to defend is uh, denial of uh, service attack. Uh, because denial of service attack is uh, can be easily put off. There are so many ways to perform a DOS on your system. So basically the object of DOS is to make a service unreliable, um, maybe uh, overloaded. Um, obviously, if you want to DDoS a web server, you can op overload the server itself. You can crash the server. Also, you can overload the communication channel that connected to the server. So there are just many, many ways uh, to pull off uh, DDoS, DOS attack. And uh, last, I think three years ago, there was a very, a very interesting paper in uh, OTA talking about DOS attack. So just now I, I explained that you can, uh, you can uh, pull off a DOS attack on the web server by blocking its direct communication channel. But in that paper, they figure out a more complicated attack, DOS attack. They do not really block the direct link from the web server to its router or its from the web server to the ISP. They identify that uh, if, uh, if you are accessing the, this web server, you are going through this, kind of this set of routers. And uh, I have a targeted DOS attack to you to access the server. So I am going to block all those routers. I'm not really blocking the last link um, of it. I'm just uh, blocking the middle. Uh, it might be complicated to explain. Uh, I will explain later when we, when we come to that topic. So typical ways to pull off DOS attack. Consume uh, host resources by forcing more computations. For example, uh, TCP same flux. Uh, so TCP, there will be a three-way handshake, and the first one, you were the, the, the client will send a same package, and the server is supposed to receive that, send back a same ACK, and also create maybe a process to wait for future um, message. But the attacker side, Maybe they just send this one package. It's very cheap for them. They just send one same package, so the, pro the server side will create a new process. And uh, it, can, it can send a lot of uh, same packets, and the server side will create a lot of new process, and uh, which consumes a lot of the host resources. But the client side, they never uh, want to really establish a TCP connection. They only want to consume host resources. This is one way. Uh, another way is uh, consuming the bad ways. Send a lot of uh, huge uh, UTP, uh, UDP um, messages or ICMP messages. And also, um, they can find a vulnerability, a weakness uh, in the host uh, server system and try to exploit uh, that bug, which may uh, crash the web server. In that case, still they put off uh, DDoS, DOS attack. 
the last uh, attack, the last attack type we're going to cover is a cache poisoning attack. So in the uh, network scenario, there are a lot of uh, caches. Uh, for example, the uh, ARP cache in your local network, uh, when you send out who has this IP address, please send me your MAC address. I will save that message, I will save that in information uh, in my, on my local machine. And that is called cache. And this is at the, this is at the data link layer. Also at the DNS layer, you have this DNS uh, cache, so you don't have to query uh, which IP address this <coughs> is every time. So this cache, since it is in the local system, it can be uh, corrupted. It can be corrupted by someone hacking your system, modify those files, those uh, cache directly, or it can be corrupted by sending the fake message to you. So uh, we are going to talk about um, a DNS cache poisoning attack later, and also the ARP spoofing attack uh, is also called the ARP cache poisoning attack because they are basically the same thing. So how can we uh, achieve security? There are so many uh, attackers out there and uh, they have so many advanced uh, uh, techniques. How can we really achieve security? So basically there are uh, two steps. We need to have a security uh, policies. We need to know what we want to achieve. For example, the policy in our Blackboard system is you are not supposed to change your score as a student. That is our policy. But we still need some mechanisms to enforce that policy. And uh, for example, the Blackboard, they make sure that only privileged users, such as an instructor or TA, can change student's score. So what kind of uh, security mechanisms they use? They were first used uh, authentication. Every time you log in Blackboard, you have to prove you are who you, who you claim you are. And there is a role assigned with uh, your identity. You are, when you log in, you are not really telling them I'm a student. Do not, you didn't say that uh, explicitly. But in the system, they already have this mapping there with your, your name to your role. And your role is a student, then you should not uh, be able to change um, your score. And the part to associate your identity to your role, student, and map your role to permissions to do all kinds of uh, operations in the system is called uh, access control. So pull, to pull out this, to, to actually enforce this security policy here, Blackboard, uh, at least they need to use authentication and um, uh, access control as the mechanisms. So we can also uh, categorize the security mechanisms in uh, at least uh, three, three categories. The first class, there are mechanisms that is supposed to prevent bad things from happening. This is for prevention. And there are but still bad things to happen, maybe because our prevention uh, mechanism is not comprehensive. It cannot defend all kinds of, of attack. It can only defend certain type of attack. So we also need uh, detection mechanisms which to detect there is an attack, there is a breach, even if I don't know how they pull that up. And the third one is uh, tolerance and uh, isolation and the response. So when an attack does happen, and it does compromise something, it does steer your data, we try to uh, do some damage control to make sure that the, the damage uh, is isolated. It were a virus compromised your computer. We make sure it will not compromise other computers in the network too. So uh, a very simple way to do that is just to take off, turn off the compromised machines. And this is a, a physical way to do it. And a different layer, we have a different ways to do it. 
So all of these uh, security mechanisms, especially used for network security, are based on crypto. So crypto is the most important foundation uh, at the protocol layer to, to do uh, network security. Uh, that's why uh, the next week uh, we are going to talk about uh, cryptos. We are going to cover uh, symmetric crypto, PKIs, public, uh, public uh, key uh, crypto. Um, so that's our stuff here today. So any questions?